Hey, Hopkins Community Church. Um, so I'm going to kind of just do like a, a single take kind of extension of what we were talking about yesterday because we didn't get through everything uh, in, in the sermon time and uh, probably could have preached for uh, a lot longer because this stuff is so good. Uh, the the stuff in uh, particularly in the Sermon on the Mount is, is just so amazing. It's so rich. Uh, and so I want to I want to finish this because we're actually moving on to, to um, Matthew six next week. And um quite frankly these things build on each other and they all come together in such a in such a beautiful way and so um remember that just remember that what we we're talking about is the fact that Jesus is actually teaching the crowds that are following him and he is he is sort of laying out this upside down kingdom and the more that i've been thinking about it i've been i've been thinking about this like all of yesterday and today too uh the more that i think about this from the very beginning jesus is is emphasizing and talking about uh the, this idea of people exhibiting the image of god so in that culture and and quite frankly in our culture today as well what we see is that there are people who are elevated right we when we see this maybe they're they they, they can be the, the rich people uh they can be people that are in positions of worldly power uh whether that's political power or economic power um sometimes uh we even see that in terms of uh, we, we see that even pushed against in in terms of gender, like uh, the idea of of like the for real idea of like sort of toxic masculinity, men that think that they are they are inherently better than women uh, or uh, racism, like the, the legit idea of racism that that white people think that because we have our white skin, that we are inherently better than and than anybody else in the world. Right. And all of that, all of that is is an affront to the image of god in human beings right in humanity in general that that we as as humans are made in the image of god and so jesus is from the very beginning in the beatitudes or we, we talked about these when he's saying blessed are the poor in spirit blessed are those who mourn blessed are the meek right he's talking about the the least the last the lost the unimportant the, those who are not in positions of worldly power and he's saying you know what those people those people are to that are who, to whom the good news is coming and and what he what the the point that he actually makes in in that we'll we'll really cover in Matthew chapter 6 is that uh those who display their uh their righteousness right doing right by god and by humanity or by other people in right relationship and so on and so forth those who display it for the public because they're so important right they get their reward and that is the temporary applause or admiration of other humans, but ultimately they do not get the reward of blessedness from their heavenly father. And so Jesus is, in a lot of ways, he's actually leveling the playing field. He's bringing low those who are high and he's raising up those who are low. Jesus says, or uh, scripture says, I think it's in uh, First Corinthians, that he came to destroy the wisdom of the, the wise uh, and they, it, we get the sense that Jesus is, Jesus is actually confronting worldly power, which is worldly power is coercive. It's power over, not uh, power among, right? It, it's not, it's not the idea of relational uh, relationships and, and, and using what, what we would consider to be godly power, which is invitational, which is the gospel, right? I, the gospel is the, is the power of God for those who believe. Roman says. So there's this sense of, of we are all equal at the foot of the cross. Um, and, and the reality then that, that when Jesus is, he is announcing that the kingdom of God is here. He typically announces that to, to the Pharisees and to those who reject him as saying, this is the kingdom of God. And if you don't listen, wipe the dust off your feet uh, disciples, apostles who are sent out, because the kingdom of God is in your midst, regardless. Um, so there's a lot that's going on here, and it, it really starts from the very beginning. And we see, I mean, and 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 to be fair, right? Those who hear, those who are in positions of worldly power, who have wealth, right, and so who hear the message of God, and who are who receive it, who are moved by that, recognize their place in the kingdom of God, and they humble themselves we recognize and 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 
you know, Hopkins Community Church, we are in in the context of the world, the, the earth, even in the context of, of Hopkins, we would represent those who are actually more in the position of earthly power. We are we have everything that we need. We are are blessed beyond anything that we could ask or for or imagine. We 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 never go without. And so we also like this is speaking to us to to remind us, hey, hey, right? Perhaps in the context of uh, the greater scope of things, uh, we don't have as much influence and power and stuff like that. Nor should we seek that. We don't need that, right? Because Christ is saying to us, blessed are you, right? When you don't seek that, but instead when you receive it from God. And this has been true all along. Right? What did, what did the people of Israel say way back in, in, in the Old Testament? We want a king so that we can what be like everyone else. We want to be like all the other nations. We want to have a king. And, and God says, hey, if you have a king, wait, just recognize, right? He should not go and seek, he should not amass for himself horses and chariots. He shouldn't amass for himself a big army. In fact, Deuteronomy actually uh to in, in order to push people towards trusting God and not in military might and in military power and earthly power. He, he comes up with so many reasons why why young men should be able to not be in the military, right? Did you just get married? You should go home. Did you just buy a house? You should go home. Did you just have, do you have a feeling you haven't planned today? You should go home, right? All of these reasons, because ultimately God is always pushing people and encouraging people. He's not coercing them, right? He's not going to force that, but he's always encouraging his people to trust in him. And, and, Spoiler alert, that's actually what we're going to talk about uh, on Sunday, the, the 14th. But here, getting back to the, the Beatitudes and stuff, uh, the Beatitudes in the, the, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, and this is really what it's about, is that God is pushing people, he, he's, or Christ is pushing uh, and, and, and essentially explaining what the kingdom of God actually is. And he's not speaking of anything new. Remember that he's not speaking of, of this sort of new law. He's not trying to countermand the law of God. He's actually fulfilling it. He's filling it full. He's talking about how what true transformation isn't about legalism. He's talking about how true transformation is actually something that happens in the heart and allows us to see others the way God sees them in right relationship with them. And, and so we, we just get this ongoing sense throughout these six case studies and the case studies begin in Matthew chapter five, verse 21. So I'd invite you still, if you have a Bible with you, or, you know, if you're sitting watching this on your phone or computer, you can also pull out your Bible and, and read through these as we go. But we talked about murder on Sunday. And we talked about how murder, you know, really sets the stage for this and, and talking about how you see other people. Because how you value other human life matters. And so it's not just about killing people, physically killing people. It's about doing emotional harm. It's about uh, spiritual harm. It's it's about the idea of raising yourself up above other people and seeing them as somehow less than you are. That's not how Jesus works. Jesus is the son of God, right? And and we are encouraged in scripture to have the same mindset of Christ who did not use that to his own, his own advantage. He, he didn't use his godness, his divinity to his own advantage, but instead he made himself nothing, right? He humbled himself even to the point of death on a cross and we are called to follow that example because in doing that christ is exalted to the highest place and and the same is true here in the beatitudes right for those who are persecuted for righteousness righteousness sake those who are persecuted because of the name of jesus great is your reward in heaven we get the same sort of arc of we humble ourselves we are following God. We are trusting in God's power. We are seeing people the way God sees them. And in so doing, there is an exaltation that takes place, not on earthly terms, right? Don't plan on having a mansion. Don't plan on having worldly power because of it. We don't need that. Frankly, we don't want it, right? Look at all of the earthly power around us. Everything, right? It doesn't matter your political affiliation, right? It doesn't matter what party uh you align with 
you don't have to look far to find out that it's corrupt and that they're doing things to gain more power for themselves regardless right and don't think about the don't think about the other party think about your own thing, right like that's that's the way to right don't that that's a, that's the speck in your eye and the, the or the the plank in your eye and the speck in your brother's eye sort of situation right that's coming in two weeks uh so it, it, the idea here is recognizing where we are and the need that we have so that we don't have an elevated view of ourselves scripture says do not think of yourself more highly than you ought but rather with sober judgment right whoa right that's a Romans passage that's applying this right here. So don't murder, but don't hate or or say say raka, which you know don't don't use derogatory terms, right? Don't say you fool. Don't call people stupid, right? And this is this is this is a big deal, and we'll we'll circle back around to this. Adultery was the same one. We say don't commit adultery, and and really what that has to do with is is he's talking to the men about lust, and 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 we nailed this hard yesterday. So if if you didn't get the sermon uh, yesterday in church, uh, I'll put a link to that the worship service, the live worship service in the in the uh, description here below. Uh, check that out first. Uh, but we hit this hard, right? That 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 again. If you're looking, men, if you're looking at a woman lustfully, you are you are literally devaluing her. You are turning her into an object for your own affection. And men, that is wrong. It's wrong. It's sinful. And it's wrong. And Jesus actually says in sort of, sort of inflammatory language, you would be better to be blind or partially blind than to do this and to be in the habit of doing this. And I was reminded after, uh, after the worship service by... Um, by pastor jim's wife beth he said she said I, I wish you would would talk to women about this as well because there's there's an important side note to this as, as well you know in in that culture um you know certain there were there were modesty codes that women were forced to follow uh, and and quite frankly those modesty codes don't really exist in our world today um and i have to say this from the outround to be honest uh, it is significantly easier for me to talk to men being a man and understanding that how this works um, from, from a man's standpoint than it is to, to talk to women. But there is a note here too, right? Women, how you dress is important, right? And and there are a lot of con conversations that go into this and, and there's no way that we can cover all of them in, in this moment. But uh, there is there is something about women, how you dress. And, and, and I understand that men, like we should be taking every thought captive and, and we should, men, we should be the ones who are, are seeking to control ourselves uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit. We should be the ones who are, who are celebrating the image of God in, in women everywhere and not lusting after them, right? Yes, 100%. Um, however, there is also this sort of third wave feminist movement that says, you know, that, that encourages women to, to take power over men. And, and, and to, you do dress however you want because you're going to get what you want if you, 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 da, 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 da. We, could, we could go on and on about this, right? And, and so, uh, and, and there's also this sense of like, well, how am I going to attract a man if I don't dress in a way where he's going to see me? And, and, and so there's this idea of, of using your body as a way of, of, of taking power over men. Uh, but let's be honest with you. Let's be honest for a second and just say, isn't that also playing into the devaluation of yourself, of your own body? By saying, well, if men are going to see me as an object, then I'm going to make myself to be the best object that I can possibly be. Instead of saying, you know what? I don't need that. I'm not going to play that game. Right. And and guys, we do the same thing, right? We get all muscly and whatever else. And and you know, we like we 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 do the same thing and and we we live in such a visual sexualized culture and and uh, and, and there's so much that goes into that. There's so many conversations that we could have here. And I know that. But I, it, what is important when we talk about this is that we talk about what's at the heart of the issue. And that is how we how we view others as those who bear the image of God. But also, friends, how we view ourselves as bearing the image of God. And both of those things are so vitally important. And in an age where self-worth self, self, self -worth 
is at a all time low because of social media, because of the comparison game, because of the way that our overly sexualized culture can't uh, doesn't uh, it, it it always especially for young women. Uh, but men too nowadays. I, I would say that there, there's always this sort of comparison. This culture has given us the idea of what beauty looks like, and it and it looks like a, a super thin model wearing practically nothing. That's the idea that culture gives us. When the reality is that the beauty is the fact that you are made in the image of God, and that your identity is in Christ. Right, He is the one who gives you worth. Worth can't be given to you by anything else because everything else is temporary. And God is eternal and God is the one who gives you worth. And so the reality for us is that the way we want to live is to honor God. In response to the fact that he has created us, the fact that he has given us worth, the fact that he has redeemed us, the fact that he gives us purpose. And that, I mean, that's true across the entire conversation of the sexual ethic, whether, whether we're talking about the way we dress and the way we look, the way we act, the, the, the relationships that we're in, even our gender identities and the, the reality of, of that honoring God and God's creation of male and female. There's a lot there. But again, it all boils back down to this one conversation about recognizing that we are created in, in, in the image of God. And that because he created us, he is the one who gives us value, worth, and therefore inherent dignity. And never, ever, ever, friends, should we succumb to the idea that we need to devalue others or devalue ourselves for the sake of personal pleasure for the sake of fulfillment in any way. Um, we talked about divorce. Uh, again, I, I, I just want to say right, divorce is one of those things that people uh, people tend to get down on. And that's like, again, this was all, this was directed at men in particular because men were the only, they, they were the, the, they were the ones in the position of power. Uh, and they were the ones who could initiate a divorce. And, and in, in a lot of cases, it was for any reason at all, as long as they deemed it to be legit. And how that, again, devalues women by letting the selfishness of a man, the selfishness of the husband, play the key role in the decision making. Right. Devaluing his wife into uh if she doesn't do what I want or give me what I want or, or say what I want or act the way I want or whatever, that I can just discard her. And, and in, in reality, we have to be honest about this too and say, right, in our culture today, this is not just a, a man-centered conversation anymore. But that because of the way that culture works and because of the way the world turns, the reality of anyone, like the, 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 the idea is mutual relationship. It's, it's, it's co, I wouldn't, codependence is such a, a bad word, but you literally two becoming one. And so if two becoming one means that one person is holding power over the other or that in, in that relationship, then, then we've missed the point. And, and this relationship in, in and of itself is meant to, it's meant to, display the fidelity of God to his people. And, and the fidelity of God to his people has always been one of active pursuit of forgiveness of love. God does not exert power over, right? He is never coercive. He is always invitational. And so again, this is about, in, in, this, in this context, this is about men honoring the image of God in their wives and that anything done in selfishness is an affront to God. And it, it, it promotes the self above the other person. In other words, it elevates that person, right? Now we have to recognize too, that there are a lot of, uh, a lot of things that, that lead to divorce in our culture today. Selfishness being one of them, 
I mean, I would say selfishness is the reason why people choose addictive behaviors over their spouse and their family. Selfishness is the reason that 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 people become abusive rather than deal with their anger issues, right? Back to the murder conversation, right? Selfishness is the reason that 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 men and women seek other uh, people out for their relational needs rather than work on the relationship themselves. There's so much that goes into it. But friends, really what this, what this gets at is, is the heart of the issue. And so, I, you know, I... I I, I speak to, you know, my divorced friends by saying, you know, like, I think this has been talked about in church in a very unhealthy way for a very long time. And that there's been a lot of judgment that has gone with it. And, and that is, that is sad and it's wrong because it's, it is another way in, in this conversation where people outside of the situation look in and then devalue you if you're divorced. Um, and I, I think that there's been a lot of unhealthy conversation about how divorced people should never, ever, ever get married again, because, you know, if they do, then they're committing adultery or whatever else. And, and, and I, 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 we also have to recognize that there's grace there and that not everybody who is divorced wanted to be divorced. And, and I would say probably the, the large majority of people that we know or that, that, you know, who are divorced, it was probably imposed upon them rather than them seeking their own selfish means. And we could just say this too, that even if even if there are those, you know, who who were the ones who pushed for the divorce in the first place, there's grace, right? Christ forgives. And and lives change. Transformation happens. Right? That's the whole premise of our faith is that at some point in time, we recognize our own sin and we seek forgiveness. We seek salvation. We seek redemption that comes in Jesus Christ. And so we shouldn't be quick to judge. That's Matthew 7. We'll get there. Because in reality, in, in reality, there's, there's, there's always more going on there. And so, right? Divorce is not the unforgivable sin, as abortion isn't the unforgivable sin, as, uh, you know, like, we can go on and on and on, right? There are no unforgivable sins. When we turn to Christ, when we turn back to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we need to recognize that for ourselves, right? Preach the gospel to ourselves, but we also need to recognize that for others and not place ourselves in, in somehow on a second tier of holiness to those who who are you know dealing with whatever sin it is like we need to recognize that so uh, all right so the the three that we didn't get to and, and this is these are these are important so i don't even know how long we've been talking but th this this stuff is just so good um so oaths this is this is what it says matthew matthew 5 verse 33 again you have heard it said uh, I was said to people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. So this is the this is where the let your yes be yes and your no be no right all else is from the devil comes from is this idea so it, let's let's give this in context again right the, the bottom line is this don't make a promise you don't intend to keep right <laughs> this is a big <laughs> this is a big one for parents right oh I promise we'll do this and then you don't do it or whatever else it's just to get them to you know to get off your back or whatever so there's that uh, I think in in general though the the reality is, again is seeing people. Uh, as image bearers of God, right? If you are making a promise that you don't intend to keep, you are devaluing someone else. You are devaluing the person. And in this day and age, so in the context of this passage, right, the, the reality was that people people weren't making oaths in God's name because in according to the law, if you made an oath uh, in the name of the Lord, you had to keep it. You were duty bound to keep it. You had to repay it. Whatever it was, you had to do it. But if you swore on God's temple, 
then you were kind of made it was kind of god but also the temple and so you didn't have to keep it because you didn't actually swear on the lord's name or make an oath on the lord's name and and, and jesus is saying you guys again this is just selfishness right it's saying you're, you're you were using somebody to get what you want with no intention of actually repaying so either do it or don't don't make it, don't lie to people, right? Don't make an oath that you don't intend to keep. Keep Tricking people into trusting you is the opposite of actually being a peacemaker. It's coercion. And again, coercion is worldly power over and against people. And this is not how God operates. It's not what his kingdom looks like. And so either say, yes, you're going to do it and then do it. Or say, no, you're not going to do it and don't do it. <laughs> And let's just talk a little bit about our culture today when it comes to this, because this is a big deal. We live in a culture today that is non-committal, right? If you put a Facebook event up there, what can you say? You say, I'm interested. And that is a definite, possibly maybe. How many people are guilty of that, right? Nobody's here, but right. This is the way that the world turns right now. Nobody is committal because we say, you know what? I, I would love to do that unless something better comes along, in which case I am what? I'm making a value statement about you versus the other thing, right? I would love to come to your party, but you know what? If the more popular kids have a party, <laughs> I'm going to go there, right? Or I would love to go to this event, but you know what? If I have an opportunity to work and make more money for myself, uh, and again, right, that's a, that's a kind of touchy issue because some people have to work and I get that. But right, the idea is you are placing a value statement. It's like, yeah, you're kind of important to me, but not as important as blank. Um, and so again, right, we're seeing people, if we're, if we're seeing people in the way that Jesus says we should see them as image bearers of God, the way that they are, right? Then when somebody presents us with an opportunity, we don't say, maybe I'll be there. We either say, yes, I'm going to be there. Or we say, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not right. Uh, excuses, whatever. I don't even know. I don't even know how, like, you just, let's be honest. What if we're just honest with people? Like, Hey, you're, you're, you're having a party. No, I don't, I'm not going to come to that. You know, uh, this is just an example from very recently, but like it, we, as a, as a family, we got together to celebrate. Um, that this was just the kind of the adults on my side of the family, and and they were throwing out dates, and I was like, no, that date doesn't work, right? I I have you know, there's been some things going on. It's really busy, and I just don't I just don't want to give up the night. It wasn't like, it wasn't like no, maybe we could make it, and then like call it off at the last minute. It's like no, just let your yes be yes, and your no be no, right? And <laughs> you know. In our culture today, you probably get uh, accused of being too blunt, but at least we're obeying scripture, right? Let your yes be yes, and you know, we don't, don't, you know, even if it's not an oath, right? If you say you're going to do something, then do it. And if you're not going to do it, then don't say you're going to do it, right? It, it, it fulfills a bunch of commands, for one, like don't lie. Uh, and it also, it also, like your heart is is for those people to know. Right. You see them as an image bearer of God. You see them as an equal. And even if you you, you decide you're not going to do that. Right. Like you're not going to you're not going to go to whatever event or whatever thing. Right. And, and this, this, this goes all over the place. Right. Borrowing, borrowing, uh, attending, uh, just participating, whatever it is, you know, like. It. It essentially says, you know, what, I value what you're doing. Or I value this thing. And so, yes, I'm going to be there. Right, right, and and I value you because I'm going to tell you the truth. Tell the truth, right? Let your yes be yes, and you know we know. Anything else? Anything else come comes from the evil one? And, and and you know, like you know this, right? Well, so and so said they might come. It's like, what does that mean? Man, that really fries me when they do that, and and it it just opens up the ground for all sorts of possibilities of uh feeling rejected or you know it it opens up the the mind the devil's playground if you will right that's where the temptations come to start thinking well you know and then you start thinking you know and then, and it it opens you up to be devaluing to others too let's honor each other and honor the image of god in each other by just 
saying yes or no. And that's okay. And we can be okay with that, right? So, all right. Uh, two more to go. Two more to go. Uh, Matthew 5.38. You have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. And this is the law of retaliation uh, in the Old Testament. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other also. And if you, if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile with them, go two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from one who wants to borrow from you. All right. So here you go. This is retaliation. Uh, it's it's uh, the, So the law of retaliation initially was actually meant to limit the amount of payback that one could be asked for. Um, and so you get this in... In the Old Testament, if you if you look through the the Levitical laws and stuff like that, if, if such and such happens, then they have to pay this, or if such and such happens, you got to do this, or so on and so forth, right? And and so what it ended up being is this is actually a law about equality to say, you know what, if 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 somebody accidentally pokes out your eye, you get to poke their eye out. That's the but that's the limit that you can go to, right? None of this sort of frivolous lawsuit of getting, you know, like what what is an eye value? The, the value of an eye in our court system today, like $3 million or some ridiculous thing. You know, like there's a, there's gotta be a limit to this because valuation of things is, is sort of subjective uh, or objective. So uh, it's objective, right? It, it depends on the person who's valuing it. Right. So it, it, there has to be some sort of equal playing field. Things needed to be equal because people are equal in God's sight. Right. We're all image bearers of God. And so equality is important. Right. Because we're all equal in God's sight. Uh, and so right, demanding more of a repayment actually com communicates to a person that you are uh, that you are more important or that I like, let's say you you did something and my hand got cut off. Right. That's uh, and, and so I'm going to say I'm more important to you that I, my hand was actually worth two of your hands. And so you should have both of your hands cut off or your whole arm cut off or whatever. Like it's, it's kind of a ridiculous statement, but the idea was that it puts people on an equal playing field. No one is more important than the other, but Jesus actually says, don't resist someone who is equal. In other words, don't demand repayment. This is an interesting thing. For one, in, in, in a lot of ways, Jesus is talking about forgiveness, and we get a little bit more into this later. Yeah, forgive each other as in Christ God forgave you, and or the, the seven, 70 times seven, the, the number of completion, that, that we should forgive each other, period. But also, um, this has to, again, do with, this, this actually has to do a lot more with, with claiming the image of God in yourself if you are the one uh, who is um, who is being like demanded of. So what you get first is the idea of uh, if somebody slaps you on the right cheek. And, and the idea in this culture was this sort of like the backhanded slap. That was the reality of what happened. And it, it was it was a dominating posture. The backhanded slap on the right cheek. So if I take my hand and do this, right? Or I'm sorry, right hand to your left cheek, right? So bam, like that. If I do that, that is a sign of domination, that I have power over you. Right. And and so, right, it it it's a sign of that person, the person that I just slapped, is is less than. However, if I turn to them the other cheek, what has to happen? They actually have to slap me open-handed, which is a sign of equality. And so you were actually demanding that that person see the image of God in you and treat you as an equal, right? That's a major statement. When, when Jesus is saying, do not resist an evil person, right? He's actually, he's actually telling you, don't allow them to dehumanize you. You are an image bearer of God as they are. And so if somebody slaps you on the left cheek, turn to them the other also. Demand, essentially demand that they have to treat you as an equal. That they have to recognize that you and them are on the same playing field. And, and part of this is meant to remind you who you are. And part of this is also to force them to remind you who you are. 
and and we don't necessarily live in in a culture of of such symbolism these days but in in sort of an honor shame culture this is a big deal because if somebody slaps you with an open hand it they are recognizing what they're doing and so that's what Jesus is saying here again right give them your tunic right if somebody uh, if, if somebody takes your shirt as well, then then give that or if, yeah, somebody takes your shirt, then give them uh, your tunic as well. So uh, what's going on here? Well, in in those days, at that day and age, if you were a poor person, you had a shirt and you had a tunic, and your tunic also doubled as your blanket for when, whenever you slept. And, you know, think about being kind of like homeless, or even if you had a home and whatever else, your tunic, which was your kind of your outer robe garment type thing, that was what ended up being your blanket at night. And so. Uh, the the law was you can't take somebody's blanket, and, and and but people, especially people who were either suing or whatever, uh, would uh, sue for the shirt because you can take the person's shirt. It wasn't against the law to take a person's shirt. Instead, it was you you couldn't take their coat, or you couldn't take their tunic, and so that's how they they circumnavigated the law. And in in reality, right, oftentimes this was happening between somebody who was rich and somebody who was poor. And in, did they did that actually need to happen? The answer is probably no, right? Do do you need to <laughs> you need to sue the shirt off of somebody who only has a shirt and a tunic? It's like really so. But again, we're talking about viewing the, the other person as an equal or the image of God, and so uh, in them, and and so Jesus is challenging this practice and saying, hey, if they're going to sue you for a shirt, give them the tunic too, because that person is going to walk away with your shirt and your tunic, and people are going to see that and go, look, like that dude, or look, that that is evil, that is wrong, right? Your extravagant generosity, your willingness to, to submit to them is actually going to put their evil on display. And it's going to force them, once again, to recognize the image of God in you, right? When you're willing to submit to that, and, and that's a trusting posture. It absolutely is a trusting posture. You're trusting in God. You're trusting that he's going to take care of you and whatever else. But you're also following what, what Jesus says, which is, you know, like, I'm willing to do this. I'm willing to give you this, right? You, you, can, you can dehumanize me and devalue me all you want. But you know what? Here, right? I'm choosing to do this. The same is true with the extra mile statement. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Now, I, I'm not necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily... I like the chosen. I've watched the chosen. I, 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 I'm not necessarily, you know, this isn't a pastoral promotion of the chosen, but there is a scene uh, in, in season four where uh, Jesus actually enacts this, this idea. He's, and I don't, this isn't actually biblical. Like I don't, I haven't seen it recorded in any, any of the gospels, but there is a scene where Jesus and his disciples are walking and they're stopped by a group of Roman soldiers. They're forced to carry all of the Roman equipment. And so they do that and they're begrudging and whatever else. And the Roman soldiers are mocking and mocking and mocking and whatever. They get to the one mile mark and the Roman soldiers say, stop. And then Jesus just keep, keeps on going. And he goes, well, Hey, the outpost is, it's just another mile up the road, right? Yeah. Well, let's go. He goes, if anybody asks, you just say we volunteered. And what happens as that as that scene continues, and it's really, I think it's only about 30 seconds to a minute or so, but what happens is as the disciples do this, they start to chuckle a little bit because of the fact that they're, cho they're choosing to do this. The Romans are stunned, silent, and then actually willingly begin to take their things back from these Jewish people who they regard as dogs and rats. And, and we see played out before is the genius of this scene. Actually, we see played out before you is that the Roman soldiers acknowledge for the first time that they're not, the Jews are not dogs and rats, but actually that they're human beings. And so if you are demanded to go one mile with somebody, you submit to that because it was the law. Right? That it was the law of the land. And so Jesus, Jesus demonstrates like submission to the law of the land. But then he he doesn't just stop there. He says, No, I'm choosing. I'm choosing, right? I am exerting my humanity. I am exerting my choice. I am an image, I am an image bearer of God, and I am choosing to go the second mile. And the person that the Roman soldier that's with him is forced into a sort of humiliated posture of recognizing what's going on it, ex it actually exposes the evil 
in a sense, the unjustness of the law, right? But Jesus doesn't challenge the injustice of that law. Instead, he exerts his humanity. He exerts the fact that he's an image bearer of God. I mean, Jesus, of course, but the rest of them as well. And the Roman soldiers are actually forced to acknowledge that because of it. It's truly amazing. And it's completely upside down, right? No one, no one acts this way uh, in, in the world right now. Like no one does, right? If you, if you, if you, if you lend money to somebody, right, you're going to do it with interest. You want them to pay you back. And if they don't pay you back, you're going to make them pay back even more, right? That's the way the world turns. It's all about power. It's all about having the wealth and the power and the authority and all these things. And, and what Jesus is saying is, you know what? Don't resist an evil person. Right? Show them the love of God because, for one, they will be forced to acknowledge the image of God in you and see you as an equal. But for two, you also need to acknowledge that an evil person is no less an image bearer of God than you are. And it challenges both hearts. In, in, in this upside down kingdom of God, it challenges both hearts. Like, and it's, I mean, let's be honest, it's, it's really difficult it's really difficult um and it's also just amazing when you think about the way that this this kind of works and what jesus is actually saying and then all of this finds it really finds its culmination uh in this last section case study number six love your enemy so matthew 5 43 you have heard that it was said love your neighbor and hate your enemy but i tell you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your father in heaven he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet your own people, what are you doing more than other, others? Even the pagans do that. You know, loving those who love you can sometimes be really hard. Um, <laughs> loving those who don't love you <laughs> is sometimes darn near impossible. And in in our age today, where our culture is so divided, where we have this sort of us versus them mentality, holy Pete's, is it so difficult? It is so difficult. To look at the the thems, whatever whoever they are, Bob Lauer called them the them brothers, but whoever them is or are, right? It's hard. It, it, it's hard to even acknowledge them, much less to show love to them. And we live in this this, this sort of echo chamber of, of everybody thinking the same way that we do, that we don't even we're like it, it's hard to even get a sense for who they are. But Jesus is, is applying all of this by saying, hey, listen, listen, if, if you're not going to resist an evil person, whatever else, all of these things, whatever it is that people are doing to you, whatever it is they're doing against you, whatever things they believe that you disagree with, whatever makes them your enemy, you love them and you pray for them because they are image bearers of God. And you are image bearers of God. And part of being in the body of Christ, part of being one with Christ, part of being children of God, is that you pray for your enemies. Because ultimately, what does God want? He wants them to be saved. And if our heart is to reflect his heart, and if we are to see them the way he sees them, then we see them as image bearers of God, and we desire for them to come to know Jesus. And that's not going to happen through antagonistic Facebook posts. It's not going to happen by demonizing or dehumanizing them. It's not going to happen by categorizing them as a different class of human being. It's not going to happen by, by saying that, you know, they're all whatever it is. It's not going to happen unless we are showing the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord, to them, to them. Whatever, whoever them are, whether it's whether it's some sort of racial minority that you can't get over, or or whether it's it's some sort of status like an immigrant that you can't get over, whether it's Russians or or, or Chinese or or Palestinians or Iranians or you know like keep going right, keep going ISIS blah blah blah. We can go on for forever. We can go on forever, right? 
Maybe they're conservatives. Maybe they're liberals. Maybe they're third party voters that you don't like because they, they screw the whole thing up, right? Or whatever it is, however you wanna get into this, the simple reality is this. You love your enemies and you pray for those who, who persecute you. And again, this, this idea of persecution comes back to the idea of being persecuted for Jesus Christ, being persecuted for preaching the gospel and for following him, not not being called names on Facebook or whatever else, blah, 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 because of your political views or something, right? You pray for them, right? And in and, and, and this day and age, it's so, so, so difficult to do this. But this is the way that Jesus points out that we are to do righteousness by showing God's indiscriminate love and generosity to everyone, including us, right? Including us. And in doing so, then, we are being peacemakers, right? Bring it full circle back around. We are the one who are seeking right relationships. We are the one who are practicing righteousness, right? Doing right by God and by others. And so there are major, major, massive implications for our culture today. We've talked about a bunch of them already, right? It is 2024. It is July. We are a month away from primaries. We are one, two, three, four-ish, four and a half, five months away from the elections, right? Things are about to get spicy. <laughs> That's a nice way of putting it. And it's really easy to not do these things uh, because the rhetoric amps up. Right. It's really easy to demonize. It's really easy to mock. I I I saw something. I I find myself laughing at political memes of memes and, and things a lot because I do and I'm human. And and I have political views, right? And so I I agree with one party and I disagree with another party. And generally, not I mean I would say that's not necessarily completely fair. I, I disagree with a lot of things on both sides, um, biblically. Um but I do find myself laughing at a lot of political memes. And, and the reality for, for, for that is, in that is, quite frankly, they're dehumanizing, right? They mock people, right? I, I, I right? I, I, we can, and, and this is an equal opportunity offender, right? Anything that's mocking another person is wrong. And it doesn't matter whether the current president or the former president, it doesn't matter whether they're old or only kind of old or whether they're young or, or whether they're inexperienced or whether they're whatever it is. Right? We are called to something better and higher than that as followers of Jesus Christ. We are called to be better than this. We are called to, to righteousness. Scripture says, this is Matthew 5, 38. This is the summary of this first chapter, this first section. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. Right? That's a really high calling. Um, it's an impossible calling without the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's an impossible calling for us because we sin regardless. But that is the goal, right? The goal is in, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing, taking on the nature of a servant and being found in human likeness, became obedient even unto death, even unto death on the cross. That is the point. That is what Jesus is pushing for right now. It's an invitation to the good life to the kingdom of God, right? It is, this is who the kingdom of God is for, and this is what the kingdom of God is about. And, and we are invited into it. But in the same way, right? If you put your faith in Jesus, then you are submitting your life to, to the Jesus commands and teaching. And, and so if you give your life to Jesus, if you recognize how, how unbelievably poor and meek and humiliated you are because of how bound you are into sin, and you commit your life to Jesus, you profess your faith in him, then you are raised up, but you are raised up with expectations that we are called to live in such a way that reflects the teachings of Jesus. It's a big calling. It's one that, that can only, 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 only be done 
in Christ. And friends, truthfully, honestly, it is the only pathway to real peace. So that's Matthew chapter 5. It's a big passage, and there's a lot there. Um, I would encourage you to, to read this again. I, I bet I bet if you were to read this a few times, you might be able to think of other things, other things that kind of fall into here. Matthew chapter 6 begins to talk about trust. Matthew 7 talks about judging, and, and there's some, some things that go on with that as well, but just the reminder, like these are kind of three sections. They all build on each other, but they're all interrelated as well. Um, because Matthew 6 opens up with this, do not practice your righteousness in the eye of the public. And we're going to talk on Sunday about what it means to be a hypocrite, right? To, to put our righteousness on display, on display for show and, and what that means too. But in the meantime, um, I'd encourage you to look through these things again. Read this passage again and again and again and again. And where God is convicting you, pray that he would He would bring out, right? He would bring that out of you. Confess your sins. And, and give them to him. And find freedom and peace in what God has to give us. We pray with me. Uh, Lord, um, we thank you for your word. Lord, may it be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our paths. Help us to, uh, to be wise <laughs> in these things. Lord, not to treat them as legalistic adventures, but Lord, uh, give us your wisdom and the desire to live in right relationship with you and with others. Lord, may, may we enact these things in our lives through the power of your Holy Spirit so that others may see and know uh, that, that there's something different here, something different about us, and that that something different is your son, Jesus, and our faith in him. So God, uh, we need your help in these things too, because it's it's difficult. It's, it's, it's impossible to do this on our own. We need you to guide us. We need you to help us. We need you, Lord. We need you. Help us to see people the way you see people. Help us to love people the way you love people. And thank you, Lord, for the grace that you show us when we fail. That in you there is forgiveness. There is another chance. And so help us to remember that grace. Remember your mercy, your extravagant kindness, your generous forgiveness. And help us to live into that each and every day and to emulate it with our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. See you Sunday.